Um, hello and welcome back to another instalment, uh, the final instalment of relativity. Today we want to do two things in the context of classical electromagnetic fields. We want to learn how to Lorentz transform electromagnetic fields. I gave that example many times of me carrying a, a, a stationary charge and me seeing electric but no magnetic field, but you seeing a magnetic field and an electric field. Question, how do we Lorentz transform both electric and magnetic fields from frame to frame? S secondly, and this is one of the biggest and most profound ideas in all of physics, quite seriously, are the Euler-Lagrange equations. Many of the, the equations of, of theoretical physics from the Einstein field equations of general relativity through to the standard model of particle physics, the Klein-Gordon equation and the Dirac equation of relativistic quantum mechanics, the D'Alembert wave equation of classical wave optics, uh, the Maxwell equations are all special cases of this uh, very, very profound thing called the Euler-Lagrange equations. So two things, uh, in, all in the context of classical, um, electromag cl classical fields from a relativistic perspective. So Lorentz transform of electromagnetic fields. We've introduced, uh, or we learned that we can, instead of describing an electromagnetic disturbance with electric field E and magnetic field B, we learned that we could introduce a scalar potential phi and a vector potential A. These were not unique, but electric fields could be derived from Electric and magnetic fields could be derived from the scalar and vector potential uh, as follows. We learned that this scalar and vector potential could be put together into an object that we learned was a tensor, the so-called four potential, a rank one contravariant tensor. And that in the so-called under the so-called Lorentz condition, the Maxwell equations written in terms of potentials, assumed a, a wonderfully simple form, a wonderfully simple form uh, that was given at the end of the last class. We um, also learned, by the way, that this, um, uh, that the Maxwell equations can be, or the core construct of the Maxwell equations can be tensorialized, uh, that this object is a tensor, uh, it's called the Faraday tensor. So, so this object is called a tensor, called the four potential, we introduced the so-called Faraday potential uh, tensor, F. Now remembering these equations, which we don't like because they're not manifestly tensorial, these equations involve the derivatives, spatial and temporal derivatives of the potentials to get the fields. But I want a tensor version of, of the electromagnetic field. We introduced the Far Faraday tensor. Uh, this is a four by four anti-symmetric matrix, uh, a rank two contravariant anti-symmetric tensor, which involves the derivatives of the potentials as follows. And in flat spaces such as we work in, uh, the derivative of a tensor is a tensor. So this object is a tensor, the tensor derivative of the four potential. Same object with the indices reversed is also a tensor. The difference of a tensor of tensors a tensor. So this object here, uh, the Faraday tensor, was a tensor and we saw that the Maxwell equations can be written uh, in tensorial form in terms of this object and the individual components of this rank two um, contravariant anti-symmetric tensor. There's six independent components which turned out to be the three Cartesian components of E and the three Cartesian components of B. So this object is a tensor and the pieces of this tensor are made from the Cartesian components of electric and magnetic field. Now since this object is a tensor, uh, it's going to transform as a tensor. Yep. Uh, it's going to transform as a tensor. So the transformation law for this object, um, here we have the usual primed and unprimed frames. And I can prime the indices or uh, the symbols defining the tensor, doesn't matter. I multiply by these p's, the partial derivatives of the new quarters with respect to the old or conversely. I need to get rid of an alpha prime upstairs, so I sum over it and have a free index alpha upstairs, uh, similarly for the beta prime, summed over and replaced with a free index. And I'll remind you that these p's, by definition, would be mu subscript. Mu prime subscript in the denominator is a, mu prime superscript, sorry, mu, mu superscript, mu prime superscript in denominator is a mu prime subscript. Uh, if I flick the primes around, we get this. These are the p's, um, and these can be read off directly from the Lorentz transformations. We learned how to do this in an earlier class. So the Faraday tensor is a tensor. It transforms as a tensor like this. 
But if I know how to transform the Fs, I'll know how to transform the electromagnetic field, the individual pieces of the electromagnetic field. So I'm going to leave it to you uh, as an exercise to um, run through this and to work out how each component of the electromagnetic field transforms from frame to frame. And the result is going to be uh, equations 194, which I'm going to write down now. So x component of electromagnetic field in the primed frame. And we have our usual standard configuration. It's the same in both frames. y component of electric field in the primed frame. Gamma factor. y component of electric field in the, y, in the s frame. Relative velocity of the two frames. Magnetic fields. So we're already seeing that um, what you call electric field in one frame is an admixture of electric and magnetic fields uh, in the other frame. Ez prime equals gamma into Ez. So again, I'm not proving this here, I'm leaving this as an exercise. And Ex, Ey, Ez are the Cartesian components of E with Bx, By, Bz similarly defined together with their corresponding primed values. Magnetic field in the primed frame, x components are the same, y components are not the same, gamma factor again. Again, these are not tensor transformation laws, so electric magnetic field is certainly not a tensor, but the, the electromagnetic field, as quantified by the Faraday tensor, is a tensor. Uh, lastly, So there we go, this is how electric and magnetic field transform, and you can deduce this as an exercise based on this object here. But this is a nice equation, these aren't, in the sense that this is a simple tensor equation, uh, and this isn't. So having left it to, to you to um, uh, deduce these transformation laws, again I re-emphasize um, an important point, that electric and magnetic fields in a sense have no independent existence. Electric field can vanish in one frame, magnetic field can vanish in one frame, but not in another frame. It's also true for electric fields. So rather than speaking of electric and magnetic fields as having independent existence, these things are relative objects. Um, uh, we instead work with a Faraday tensor, which is also a relative object. It depends, the values of the Faraday tensor depend on the frame, but having s said that, um, it's going to transform as a tensor and therefore is a geometric object in the sense that I've described earlier. So to make these comments more concrete, um, let's apply our general formulae for the Lorentz transformation of electromagnetic fields to a particular scenario, uh, which is this scenario here. So we have our usual pair of inertial frames in standard configuration with respect to each other. We're going to nail a charge, a, a point charge with magnitude, um, with positive point charge Q. Um, or charge Q to this origin. So as far as the prime frame is concerned, this point charge is stationary uh, and sitting at the origin of S prime. We have our axes in tensor notation X1, X2, X3 and the corresponding primed quantities. Uh, just a couple of symbols. I'm going to denote by N hat. If I don't have primes, it's relative to S and if I do have primes, it's relative to S prime. Um, there are a couple of abs um, Q, however, is an absolute. The charge is the same in both frames, and the relative um, uh, speed is V in both frames. But with those exceptions, uh, primed refers to quantities in S prime and unprimed to quantities in S. So we have psi and psi prime being this angle here. We have theta and theta prime being this angle here. Um, we have a unit vector n hat or n hat prime, which directly points from the um, charge Q to a particular observation point that's going to be fixed uh, at some height B in S's frame at some height B. So we're going to have a, an observation point. We're going to consider the entire field, um, the electromagnetic, or the field due to this object in either frame, uh, only calculating at this observation point P, which is at a height B um, above the origin of S and fixed to the vertical X2 axis, the vertical Y axis of S. By the way, because of the Lorentz transformations, we're moving this way. Um, both S and S prime will agree that this distance is B. 
uh, that's it for the symbols. So uh, um, also this distance here, um, according to the time t of the S frame, there's no prime here, will be Vt. But what we want to do is to study the electric and the magnetic field um, as a function of times, t or t prime, uh, ultimately t, for an observer that's nailed to the origin of p. So this is going to finally render quantitative this example that I've used several times of me carrying uh, a, state, a point charge that's stationary relative to me. Question, what electromagnetic field do you see if you're on this perch at P? So P for perch. So let, let's, let's do it. Let's write down the expressions. And as you so, so often do in relativity, begin by working in the frame in which things are simpler. Uh, this scenario here uh, is simplest in the primed frame, where you have one stationary point charge, where you have electrostatics. And since you have uh, electrostatics, the magnetic field is certainly going to vanish. So all Cartesian components of the magnetic field, in fact everywhere, but in particular at the observation point P, all Cartesian components of the magnetic field in the primed frame vanish. So, so much for the magnetic field. Electric field, different story. Um, we're going to need Coulomb's law. So let's work out the primed component of electric field. But remember, this is the primed component of the electric field. You know, we're in frame S, so you're standing here, right? A particular instant of your time, T prime. You're actually calculating the electric field and magnetic field at this point, P which is actually going to be moving with velocity v to the left um, relative to u. That doesn't change the fact that your magnetic field everywhere in space is, is zero, hence the magnetic field, every component thereof in the primed frame vanishes at this point, which is moving, certainly moving relative to u. Again, we're in the primed frame. Even though the reference point is moving, we can still use electrostatics. We know that we have um, uh, a field filling space. Now, I mean, Gaussian units here, so the electric field in the primed frame um, is going to be the charge times the outward pointing um, normal vector, which I'll, be, which I'll call n hat prime, divided by r squared. If you're in SI units, you'd have k times q uh, on r squared. Uh, we're not in um, SI units, we're in Gaussian units, and, and this um, pointless constant isn't present charge, uh, one on R squared law, Coulomb's law, yep. But I need, the electric field's going to be pointing out here for a positive charge Q, electric field will be pointing out this way, and its projection onto the X1 prime axis will be negative, yep. So electric field in the X direction, we're going to have a negative because of the projection onto the X prime axis. Um, we have our Q on R squared that I'll leave alone. Sorry, this is R prime squared r prime squared, q on r prime squared, Coulomb's law, uh, and to project onto the x-axis, I need to multiply by cos of theta prime. Remember, this would be called theta prime in the primed frame. Good. Uh, to take this one step further, um, I would write, I'll leave these terms alone. And this two, by the way, is about to change. Cos theta prime, think about it, cos theta prime is going to be vt prime on r. vt prime on r is the cos theta prime. Using similar logic, you can work out the y component of electric field at the point p, the, moving, the point p which is moving relative to s prime, all from s prime's perspective. And you'll get q sine theta prime on r prime squared, and using a similar trick here, you'll get this as being qb on r prime cubed. Z component, z prime component, sorry. In other words, the x3 component, x3 prime component by symmetry, um, this electric field vector will have a zero projection into this plane. So z prime component vanishes. So here's the three components of electric field and magnetic field, respectively, in the primed frame at the point P.
Now, at this point, I don't like these formulas because ultimately I want to transform from the S prime frame to the S frame. And I don't like these formulas because I've got prime quantities on the left and I have uh, primed quantities on the right. What I want to do is to get rid of all these primed quantities. I want to get rid of the prime quantities on the right, so I have a nice equation, prime quantities on the left, unprimed on the right, which I'll then be able to transform using actually not these equations, but their um, inverses. So I'm going to leave it to you as an exercise to get rid of the primes on the right-hand side. But let me just give you an example. You know this Lorentz transformation formula. Yep. If we're nailed to the, that post, we're nailed to the post, right? Here, um, x1 prime, oh, which is this x, is going to vanish. So at the observation point p, this disappears. We just have t prime being gamma t. Yep. So that will let you uh, get rid of um, these primes from the t, for example. Yep. Yeah, it'll let you get rid of those primes from the t. Another thing, r prime, just by Pythagoras' theorem, will be the square root of uh, b squared plus this distance squared. And that distance squared will be v squared t prime squared. But t prime squared is gamma squared t squared. So you can do this kind of stuff. Uh, I'll leave the rest uh, of the fun to you. The point is that you can, um, or you need to, we want to, eliminate the primes from the right-hand side of these equations. I'll just write down the result. When you do so, E x prime, E y prime, z prime vanishes, I won't write it down, Q v gamma t uh, divided by b squared plus gamma squared v squared t squared to the 3 on 2 and qb divided by also to the 3 on 2. So I've got expressions for e x prime, y prime, z prime, etc. in terms of the unprimed quantities and I want to go backwards. Uh, I want to go backwards. Uh, we're going to need the inverse form of these equations because we want to calculate e x, y, and z, etc. Right. So let's turn these into the inverse forms with the v reversal. Interchange primed and unprimed quantities. So where I see a prime, I get rid of it. Where there is no prime, I put one there. Getting rid of my primes, putting them where they weren't previously and I replace V with minus V. Minus V becomes plus V. Plus V becomes minus V, etc. Plus V becomes minus V, minus becomes plus. Gamma factors unchanged. So now we can write down expressions for E X, Y, Z, V X, B, Y, B, Z in terms of the prime quantities. And the prime quantities um, are, the, are the formula that we have uh, here. Uh, the other components all vanish. So you can shove these expressions for EX prime, EY prime, the other things that vanish, EZ prime, all these vanish, stuff them into these formulas, and what you'll get will be the transformation law for electric and magnetic fields applied to this problem. In other words, the X component of electric field, Y component of electric field, etc., according to S, uh, relative to the, this point P, that's stationary, relative to S. So when you do this, you'll get some big formulas. Um, EX equals um, minus QV gamma T. Again, at this point, I'm looking at these equations and, think, and thinking, what do they mean? Can I think of them geometrically? Can I think of them uh, pictorially? How do I make these equations, as it were, s speak to me in a physical intuitive sense? So E y will be gamma Q B. So this is, these are all time dependent, as you would expect, because as far as the observer at their perch is concerned, these, uh, the charge that they're looking at is moving. 
Z component of elect magnetic field, there is a magnetic field present, according to the observer at P, even though S prime says there's no magnetic field present. And this magnetic field is just going to be V times the Y component of electric field, I won't write it out on C. Um, and all other components vanish. So on the one hand, I'm happy because I've calculated what I wanted, which is the non-zero components of electric, and, and now we have magnetic field at this point P. Uh, I've calculated it, so I'm happy, but I, I want a picture. I want to be able to visualize what's going on. Again, I emphasize what appears as a purely, what, what is a purely electric field to S prime is a combined electric and magnetic field in S. Again, these objects are time dependent, and what I want to do is to f focus on this object here. I want to focus on this because it is what you might call uh, the transverse magnetic, electric, tr sorry, transverse electric field, the electric field in the um, y direction, the x2 direction which depends on time, and I want to consider this time-dependent electric field seen by this observer here as I watch the charge go past them. So we're focusing on this formula. Now I could look at it and say, what is the peak value? Well, the peak value, the biggest value of the transverse electric field will occur when the denominator is the smallest, which is going to correspond to T being naught. So the peak value uh, of this transverse electric field will occur at t equals naught, and at t equals naught, we'll get gamma QB divided by, this term switched off, we've got B to the three, yeah, B to the three, so you've got gamma Q on B squared. Already we notice something interesting, that the peak value of the transverse electric field gets bigger as gamma gets bigger. Yep, so if I was to plot um, versus time, and this is all from the perspective of an observer perched at the perch P, and we've, we're plotting the transverse electric field. I'm implicitly assuming Q to be a positive charge. Um, transverse electric field considered as a function of time. We've just learned it has its maximum value at T equals naught. Uh, and that the height of this and hence the magnitude of the peak is proportional to the gamma factor. The faster the object is moving, the bigger the peak value of the electric field. Now this object varies with time, and you can ask the question, um, you know, as time uh, gets bigger, this transverse electric field will die off. This formula is actually symmetric in time, so we'll have a formula that, um, that looks like this. Question, what is the full width at half maximum of this object? Now you can do that yourself. Uh, when you determine the full width at half maximum of this object, you'll get B on gamma V, um, which is inversely proportional to gamma. That's the key point. So as the charge goes faster and faster, as uh, relative to the observer at point P, the peak value of transverse electric field um, diverges as gamma, or grows as gamma, uh, but the full width at half maximum shrinks as gamma. Interesting. Now, another way to look at the problem is to ask about the spatial variation of the field. Um, so the spatial variation of the field um, relative to the instantaneous present position of the charge uh, as far as the S prime frame is, cons S frame is concerned. Now, I'm going to leave it to you as an exercise to show the following. So here's the electric field filling all space according to the unprimed frame. Yep. Here's R. Uh, and this R will be, this vector R, by definition, is the scalar R, this distance here, times um, n hat. So this is just the outward pointing radial vector from the charge to the observation point. And we have a scalar multiplying this. The bigger the charge, the bigger electric field. The electric field is purely radial. Uh, I'm going to define a symbol called beta, which is V on C. R cubed gamma squared. So, so far we have a formula that's isotropic. Electric field is the same in all directions for all th thetas. But now we're going to introduce an anisotropy, or we'll, sorry, discover an anisotropy when you work out this formula. 
this sine squared psi term to the power of three on two gives an anisotropy. Uh, it gives an anisotropy to this um, uh, electric field lines. So if you would actually plot this electric field, okay, when v equals naught, beta vanishes. We have no angular dependence, and so if v equals naught, you would have your electric field lines obeying Coulomb's law, and so the um, Faraday electric field lines would be. Um, isotropic, right? But when V is non naught, what you get, um, this anisotropy I mentioned earlier, you get um, a compression along this direction. And by the way, this was known to Lorentz uh, prior to Einstein's work, um, and he argued that if, you know, this is really just a compression, it's a length contraction, right? Um, it's a length contraction. He argued that if electric fields, for example, um, surrounding point charges contract, then so too does all matter. That's why it's called the Lorentz contraction, not the Einstein contraction. This is a velocity vector, not electric field vector. Uh, and this idea, this thing here now becomes clear because if you have this um, wisp room pattern, which is sweeping past you uh, as the observer P, you basically see bugger all. So you're P, you see bugger all. Then you get this big whack of electric field, then it turns off again, which is precisely what this is. And the faster the object travels, uh, the more the length contraction, the more this appears like a flying dinner plate. By the way, they model um, relativistic nuclei as flying dinner plates, right? So, so, so much for, for this problem, the first half of this lecture. Now I want to move on to what in many respects is the sort of the, the what you might call the, the crowning glory of this course. I mentioned earlier that these uh, Euler-Lagrange equations are pretty special. Yep. Bad joke. Um, these Euler-Lagrange equations are very special in the sense that it's one of the biggest ideas in, in all physics, if not the biggest idea in all physics. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so many key equations in theoretical physics are special cases of this, from the Einstein field equations to the um, of general relativity through to, uh, through to the standard model of particle physics, the Dirac and Klein-Gordon equations of classical, uh, of quantum, um, relativistic quantum mechanics, the D'Alembert wave equation, the Maxwell equations, uh, and so on. So kind of important. And it all begins with, or we can, let, let's go back to Fermat. Uh, who had a principle of least action or a principle of least time. And I want to just um, couch this in terms of light. So if you were to have, let's say, glass and, and vacuum and you would ask the question, I know that light starts at point A and ends at point B, what path does it travel? Well, let it travel an arbitrary path. And you can argue based on symmetry it must travel a straight line in um, each medium. And you ask the question, what path does it actually take? Well, we, we know that refractive wavelength of light in vacuum, call it lambda. In the medium, it becomes lambda on n. The wavelength where n's a refractive index, the wavelength changes. And so we could count the number of wavelengths along each point in the path. Light will take the path that minimizes a certain quantity, in this case, the number of wavelengths along the path. Just to repeat, the path that light travels will minimize a certain quantity, in this case, the wavelength of light along a path. If I do the same thing with an inhomogeneous medium with a refractive index that varies with position, I'm fixing my beginning and end points. Refractive index is now a function of position. In general, it can trace an arbitrary curved path. Question, which path does it take? Answer, it'll take the path. Again, the, the wavelength will in general be changing with, with, um, with, with uh, position because the refractive index is changing. Which path does it take? It takes a path that corresponds to the minimum um, number of wavelengths. So this is called the principle of extreme action. Now, if we want to generalize this, what we, what we say is that there's some quantity along the path. Now, as a, a little light bullet traverses the path, there'll be some quantity, let's call it L, and that will be time dependent. And as we integrate along the path, we get a certain quantity. And we give this quantity a name, we call it the action. 
uh, given the symbol S, uh, and it is a minimum for light paths. More generally, it's what's called an extreme value. It can be a maximum or a minimum. So when I say principle of least action, I really should call it the principle of extreme action. I'm not, justifi I'm not justified why it could be a maximum or a minimum. Now this idea turns out to be one of the deepest in physics because um, this idea of minimizing some quantity of you know, which configuration does the light ray take, what um, state of the field does nature choose? The answer is it chooses the state which minimizes this so-called action. And this is a very, very deep idea, um, which again leads to so many field equations. Um, and this idea is going to be captured in a relativistic setting in the so-called Euler-Lagrange equations. So let's do some relativistic field theory. Let's uh, do this. But before I go on, one point. I don't like this equation because uh, it's um, not very relativistic in the sense that we've um, chosen to integrate over time. Instead of having uh, a Lagrangian, so this has a name, it's called a Lagrangian. Uh, again, this is called the action. Let's have what's called the Lagrangian density, denoted by script L. And by definition, when you integrate this object over space, you get the Lagrangian, right? This thing whose integral over time is minimized. So this is like a, a Lagrangian, this is like an L per unit volume. So when I integrate both sides with respect to T, I learned that this is my action. We learned that this action S is the integral over space-time uh, of this L per unit volume, this Lagrangian density. And when I'm integrating over space-time, I'm happy, right? Because this object here will be the same in all frames. This is a volume element in space-time. This um, Okay, it's a product of tensors, it's a tensor, but it's just a volume element in space-time that does give us stuff, what uh, inertial frame you're in. This is an invariant. This is a Lorentz scalar, rank zero tensor. This object is something upon which all inertial observers will agree. Question, how do I generalise this principle of least action, or more properly the principle of extreme action, to a relativistic setting? So let's have a relativistic setting where I have some fields. Now I'm going to use the symbol X here. Synonymous with x mu, so x is not, not going to be the x coordinate, it's going to be a space time coordinate. And I want to have some field I call phi, some relativistic field phi, as a function of x, y, z, and t, as a function of x. Yep. And this is not a tensor index, this is just a set of fields, and r is just a label labeling that set of fields. Um, I'm going to have a total of little n fields, and whichever field theory I want to subscribe to, I'll have n scalar fields. Just as a point of notation, I'll remind you that um, when I write down defy dx superscript mu, I could also write that as del subscript mu acting on phi, and as a very dense notation we met earlier, I can indicate partial derivatives with a comma, like this. Similarly, if I differentiate with respect to x subscript mu, that becomes a superscript. And again, differentiation denoted by a comma. I could put it downstairs or upstairs, I don't care, but I'm going I'm to leave them downstairs. Uh, comma, subscript, mu, superscript. So this is just some notation. By definition, I'm going to assume this um, Lagrangian density. And this is an assumption, will be a function of the fields together with their first derivatives. Yep, their first derivatives in this sense of the term. That's an assumption. Um, it's going to be good enough for all the field theories I mentioned earlier. If you have dissipative field theories or systems with memory uh, and other exotic systems, uh, then you may need to generalize what we're about to do. So let's now have some arbitrary volume of space-time. There it is, it's some blob in space-time. Uh, and this blob, every point inside and on this volume I'm going to call omega. Um, I'll denote the boundary um, of this volume by del omega. And for simplicity, let, let this be, there's no holes in it, it's one lump of plasticine, simply connected, smooth surface, etc. 
Now this action that I mentioned earlier will be a function of the volume in space-time and by definition, but as motivated by um, this discussion here, uh, we're integrating over our four-dimensional volume d4x is the volume element, it's dx dy dz dt or dx naught dx1 etc. In fact it's the latter, a Lagrangian density and this is a comma and this is a partial derivative comma. Yep. So I asked here, what does nature choose? What configuration of the system does nature choose? By the way, there's never a convenient time to do your shoelaces up. Um, what configuration of the fields does nature choose? And the answer is, it'll choose the one that um, minimizes the action. So here we can consider all possible paths, but nature chooses one particular path, right? The path of extreme action. Now we can consider something more abstract, all possible fields. Which field will nature choose? Well, uh, in that setting, let's have all possible fields existing in this volume of space-time. Not just the field that nature chooses, which is this one, but let's take the field that nature chooses, because the field that nature chooses will obey whatever uh, law of nature that field obeys. Let's take the field that nature chooses and stuff it up. Let's add some perturbation, which I'm calling delta phi. So here we're continuously deforming the field at every point in space, at every instant of time, inside and on this volume omega. We're deviating the field from the value that nature chooses in an arbitrary way. Or well, it's not that arbitrary, I want this screw up, this stuffing up of the fields, this continuous deformation of the fields, I want it to vanish um, on the boundary. Now that's going to be ha harmless if I make the, the, the uh, um, omega fill the whole universe and I demand that my fields vanish at the edges of the universe. Um, but this technical assumption will be needed um, uh, um, by the end of this class. So we're allowing the field to take all possible values, the analogue of um, all possible paths here, but massively generalised. Now I'm going to denote by this, so we're using what's called this is what's called variational calculus, and we're doing it with tensors in four-dimensional space-time, so it's a bit full-on. Um, but what we're doing here is we're asking the question, what is the change in the action when you change the fields, right? If we just had a single variable, um, if phi was a single variable, then nature would choose either the maximum action or the minimum action, right? So let's, let's have a local minimum. The action, graft versus phi, if that was a single variable, nature chooses the minimum or the maximum. Extreme value. But this is not a single variable. It's actually a field, right? But if you can get your head around that, instead of having one horizontal axis, you have infinitely many, um, then it, it's, it's the same thing, local minimum. The action must be a local minimum or local maximum. Nature will choose uh, the field that minimizes this object, and this, this is all this says. It's really just a notation for saying principle of extreme action. And the claim is that this statement that nature will choose, the, you know, if, you, if you give me the wrong field, then nature will, will choose this to make the field, the physical field, um, uh, minimise the action. That is the, the, the field configuration nature will choose. And the claim is, um, just to cut to the answer, which I'll derive in a second, that the derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to the fields minus, remember the Lagrangian density uh, depends on both the fields and their derivatives. The claim is that the derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to the fields minus um, this um, space-time derivative of the derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to the second variable in inverted commas and the second variable is uh, phi r comma alpha. The claim is that this is naught. That is your field equation of which all those field equations I mentioned earlier are special cases. This is called the Euler-Lagrange equation um, and it can be viewed as a machine. You give me a particular L which is actually a rank zero tensor, which is often the simplest L you can possibly make out of the relevant physical quantities. 
you stuff it through this, the Euler-Lagrange equation, and you will get a field equation, which is this. Yep. So rather than asking the question, what configuration does nature choose, we're actually saying what law of nature exists to force the principle of least action or the principle of extreme action. It's a very, very, very general, very, very powerful um, idea. I need to now fill in the steps from here to here. So the claim is that zero is the change in the action that you get when you start from your true field configuration and you deform it in an arbitrary way, uh, deform each field at every single point in space and time in an arbitrary way, as long as it's continuous. Um, I want it to be differentiable so I can shove it through integrals. And I'm going to make that variation vanish on the boundary. Apart from that, arbitrary variation of fields leads to uh, what's called a stationary action, in essence a global minimum or maximum. So this is the change in. So delta here is used in the sense of the change in the action, which is integral over our space-time volume. D4x is our volume element. Lagrangian density, which depends on two variables, which are themselves functions, phi r and phi r comma alpha. Now we just use the um, chain rule. I'm going to bring this delta in. Right, I'm going to bring the delta in. And I have this Lagrangian which depends on two variables. You know, if this was dv, I'd have um, d by dx of dv dx plus d by dy of dv dy. Here, instead of variables x and y, we have functions, which are these things, but same idea, right? So differentiate the first thing with respect to the first variable, phi r, and then delta phi r, yeah, just a chain rule. Okay, we're in four-dimensional space-time with tensors, but it's still the chain rule. So this is like um, delta L is dl, the first variable, the first variable, plus dl, the second variable, d or delta second variable. And never mind that the variable is the derivative, is, um, the derivative of each field with respect to a particular space-time coordinate. Now, to proceed further, I need to focus on this term. What I need to do is to integrate by parts in four dimensions. I need to integrate by parts in four dimensions. So let's put this to one side and do that. So here I'm differentiating with respect to space-time position uh, the following object. You might think, where does this come from? Answer, trial and error. I'm going to more, I just want to differentiate this object and I'm going to use the product rule where I differentiate the first thing, differentiate the first object, leaving the second object alone, and then I add, I leave the first object alone. And I differentiate the second, d by dx superscript alpha of the second object. Now I've done this because the term that I've underlined in green here is precisely this term here. Yep. In other words, the term underlined in green is this minus this. Just to repeat, the term underlined in green is this minus this. So to reflect that fact, let me just take this first term on the right-hand side and move it to the left-hand side. Yep. So I've now got an expression in my big yellow brackets that I can substitute into this object here. Good. So let me do that. Naught equals integral over the volume element. We're going to have three terms now, right? The first uh, is this one here. 
The second was this, but it's now the difference of these two things. Now, for reasons that will become clear in a second, I want to write this one down first. Minus d by dx alpha, uh, dl, etc. So I've written this one down first. And by the way, there's a delta phi r in common. So let me factor it out. And then we have one extra term, which is this thing, which I'm going to write as a separate integral. This thing. Now, Gauss divergence theorem works in arbitrarily many dimensions. This is a four-dimensional divergence, right? When I take the divergence of a vector in 3D, let's say this is fx, f, fy, fz, or, sorry, let me call it, yeah, fx, fy, fz, you differentiate the first component, you differentiate the second component, you differentiate the third component, and you add them all up. If we're in 4D, um, you'd add another one. Well, that's precisely what this does. Right? This is a tensor that has an alpha superscript, and that, um, sorry, it has an alpha, uh, an alpha superscript. Um, and this is effectively an alpha subscript, and so we've got a summation over the alphas. So you're differentiating with respect to every variable, each component of this tensor. This is actually a four divergence. This is a divergence in four dimensions. And because, and so this is a divergence in four dimensions, and by the divergence theorem when you integrate, which works in any number of dimensions, when you integrate a divergence um, over a surface, over, over a volume, you end up with the flux of that field through the boundaries of the volume, the flux of the field through the boundaries of the volume, but um, the boundaries of this volume are going to be at the edges of the known universe. Uh, if I take this omega to be arbitrarily large, um, uh, and besides, this thing's vanishing. Sorry, besides, this is vanishing at the edges of the volume. So this object, when you apply the Gauss divergence theorem, you, you get the flux of this object to the boundary. But because um, of this condition here, this term will switch off and kill this term. Alternatively, you could take your boundary to the edges of the known universe um, and demand that the flux of whatever tensor field you get here vanishes at the edges of the known universe. So we get this expression here. 0 equals this integral. Now, this is arbitrary space-time volume, any space-time volume, right? And I want this to be true always for any space-time volume. Uh, and this object is an arbitrary variation of the fields. Arbitrary, you can pick it. It could be the face of, a smeared out face of Albert Einstein, whatever you want within the volume. Arbitrary. The only way this thing's going to vanish, if what's in round brackets vanishes, and the statement that what's in round brackets vanishes is the Euler-Lagrange equations. Yep. So that's it. Uh, we've used the principle of least action in a, in a generalized setting to deduce these Euler-Lagrange equations. I just want to finish off with the principle of simplicity. I emphasized earlier, you pick a Lagrangian density, you shove it through these equations, and you'll get your associated field equations, which is precisely this. As an example uh, of this logic, suppose that we have vacuum, no charges, no sources, and I fill this with electromagnetic field. The only object I have to describe that electromagnetic field is the Faraday tensor. There it is. Question, what is the Lagrangian density for the electromagnetic field? Well, this is a rank zero tensor. I want to use the principle of simplicity, this very profound idea that the laws of physics, when viewed from a tensor perspective, are in many respects are as simple as they could be. I ask the question, what is the simplest rank zero tensor? Script L is a rank zero tensor. What is the simplest rank zero tensor I could possibly construct out of this object? One of the very few answers you could write down would be the following. You need to sum over both those indices. So you have a mu and a nu downstairs. What's the simplest thing I could do? We'll shove an F in front of it. 
Um, this gives the inhomogeneous Maxwell equations. Now, there's a factor here which actually doesn't change the outcome, 1 over 16 pi, but this gives the um, inhomogeneous, uh, sorry, the homogeneous Maxwell equations in vacuum. Start again, the inhomogeneous Maxwell equations in vacuum uh, you get from this. Shove this Lagrangian density, one of the simplest you could possibly construct, into the Euler Lagrange equations, squared equation in the top board, uh, and you will have the Maxwell equations in vacuum, or half of them. The other half, by the way, are an identity. If, on the other hand, I want to fill my space with sources, well, I'm going to have my four current, my charges and my currents, so those are the sources of the fields. What's the simplest thing I could do to get rid of that? I need no subscripts or superscripts, I need to get rid of them. Well, I need an alpha to sum over. What's the simplest thing I could sum over? Well, this is one of the simplest things you could do. This is the four current, this is the four potential. It's also natural that these should be connected together because currents generate fields and fields generate currents. You'd expect the resulting equations to be modified um, in light of coupling charges to fields. Now, there happens to be a constant here, but the point is, this will now generate your full inhomogeneous Maxwell equations, and the other Maxwell equations are identities. So we can start to say things such as, what is the simplest tensor um, Lagrangian density rank zero tensor that I can construct from my relevant field quantities? And the answer is, muck around, and when you do that with the relevant quantities, you'll generate about three quarters of the known laws of nature, which is kind of cool. That's it, thank you.